Can I have Ryan Rice and Lawrence Katapatuk? Katapatuk? To come up and present? Sit here, or yeah, anywhere. Anywhere. anywhere? Well, maybe, maybe I'll stand. Yeah. Good job. Good English. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Miigwech. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Lawrence Katapetic. Uh, junior, uh, I've been working for Cree Nation government under Capital Works for the last five years as a regional housing planner. My main uh, focus is on home ownership in the uh, Cree communities. Uh, last year we did a financial tour in the uh, Cree communities. We visited all nine communities to do a presentation on how to get ready for home ownership and how to personal, uh, do your personal uh, budgeting. Uh, we hired uh, my colleague here, Ryan Rice, he's from uh, Kanawagi. He's been working in this field for the past 20 years, over 20 years, in helping uh, individuals, youth, in, uh, with their credit or with their personal financial uh, budgeting to, get, to have them ready for a home ownership. Uh, we are continuing our, our tour, our financial uh, budgeting tour. We did already uh, three communities in June, in July, and uh, next week we'll be in uh, Chesapeake, August 21 and 22. We encourage all uh, people from Chesapeake to come uh, to our evening sessions. Uh, plus, um, you don't have to be in from the community. If you, anybody can come, we, we uh, welcome anyone uh, to come sit in our presentations. In uh, September, we're going to be in uh, Wimingji, but uh, it's not confirmed yet, but uh, Wimingji is uh, September, October in East Maine, and Nemeska on uh, November. We will have the uh, schedule ready. Uh, you can check your local housing department for our confirmed dates. So um, I'm going to give it to uh, Ryan, Ryan Rice, so he's going to introduce uh, himself more and uh, what we're working on uh, on this uh, financial tour. Thank you, Lawrence. Good afternoon, everybody. Seigo Agoguego. My name is Ryan Rice. I'm a Mohawk from down south in Gunawage. As Lawrence uh, just mentioned, I've been doing this type of work for the past 22, going on 23 years, helping people that are having financial difficulties, people that are having um, uh, trouble getting ready for home ownership, specifically. So getting their credit scores to a certain point, getting their personal finances sorted out, and developing a financial plan that will help them be able to sustain a mortgage. Um, just to, to add a little bit to what Lawrence mentioned, over the last year and uh, about a year and two months now, we've traveled to each of the nine communities and we've done two stops so far on this second round of uh, community tours. So 11 of these uh, evening sessions, we have them in the evenings, and uh, in that time, as much as I've been sharing information and sharing knowledge and, and helping people uh, prepare themselves financially, I'm also learning a lot from uh, each of you and all of your communities. So each stop, I usually pick up uh, two or three clients that I'm working with ongoing, helping them with their finances. And I get a lot of phone calls. I, I have actually uh, my business card and we have some pamphlets and some copies of the presentation on the table on the uh, left side over here, which you can uh, take and feel free and review at your, at your convenience. So with handing out my business cards, I get a lot of phone calls, a lot of texts, a lot of emails, people with just very specific questions about their finances. It, it might not be, their goal may not be to uh, be a homeowner in the near future, but they have some questions to help themselves financially. So we've been keeping a log, and now we're over, we're well over 400 individual inquiries. So from those 400 individual interactions and conversations, I think I'm picking up a good sample of, of your uh, communities, uh, your, I guess, your needs, your goals, and also your, a good average maybe of your individual personal financial situations. 
So going into this tour over a year ago, we didn't have too much information on how uh, good or how poor financial standings were. But over the last year and two months, I think we learned a lot and we're getting a more clearer idea. And it's really, the, the picture is getting very obvious that this type of work, uh, assisting individuals with their, their finances, whether it be just their day-to-day -day finances or preparing for a mortgage for their own family home, it really, there has to be more assistance and resources put in place in each of your communities. So with that said, the two evening sessions that we hold in each community, they're not the same information. We get a lot of, um, I guess, misunderstanding with that. People think we're, we usually come in on a Tuesday night and a Wednesday night evening into two presentations. A lot of people think it's the same presentation just done over. Uh, it isn't. It's part one and part two. Okay, so we tried to condense, Lawrence and myself, we tried to condense the information all into one evening but it was just too much. It was running close to three hours. It's difficult for people to sit down. I mean, let's face it, financial information is not the most uh, entertaining uh, <laughs> things we can, we can speak about, especially people are giving up their free time in the evening. So we had to split it up into two evenings. So part one is usually about an hour and a half. We take a break in the middle, and part two is usually about an hour and 15 minutes or so. So what you get out of the two sessions is one, it's a clear picture of what you need to understand when you're preparing for home ownership. So when you go to a bank and you apply for a mortgage, you really want to understand what that loan officer is thinking, how they're measuring you, how they're judging you, whether they're going to say yes or no on your mortgage application. So we cover all the bases on what you should be aware of, what you should know. The second night, we get really down to the nuts and bolts and we actually work through a sample uh, financial plan, just an example, for an average household in one of the nine communities. So we look at how to put it down on paper, how to measure your income, how to measure your expenses, especially your walk-around expenditures, and how to put it all down on paper so you get a good idea of how your money is coming into your lives and how you're spending it. What I've come to realize in my year and change now, working with, uh, ongoing, I'm working with of over 30 uh, clients now, singles and couples, individuals and couples, and I can say without a doubt that many, many people, and then all the questions I'm getting in between, many, many people don't really have a good idea of how their money is flowing through their lives. They know how much they get paid for their job, they know how much they earn, and they sort of have a general idea of how much they spend, but not really, right? They just kind of track their bank account, they track how much money is either in their pocket or their wallet or their purse. They use their credit cards, they use store cards, they go shopping, and they're not really sure of how the money's flowing in and out. So what I'm getting a lot is um, the first thing we do when I start working with a, with a new person is we look at their credit score. So it's very, very important for you all to understand, everybody in this room right now that has any form, has used any form of credit, whether it's a, a bill for a cell phone, leasing a vehicle, whether it's a four-wheeler, a truck, a boat, a skidoo, anything. Um, if you have a credit card, if you have a store card, you have a credit history and you have a credit score that's linked specifically to you. So it's, uh, we're not going to go through the presentation today. It takes too long, but I'm just going to touch on some of the main areas. So one of the main areas of discussion when we go through the presentation is what is a good credit score versus what is a poor credit score and what credit score do you need to actually qualify for a mortgage? So credit scores, they range really from 300s up to the high 800s. A perfect credit score would be 900. Uh, nobody has a perfect credit score. And nobody uh, throughout uh, the globe has a perfect, perfect credit score. But someone that has a credit score in the 700s, you're going to get an approval for a mortgage. That's telling a lender, whether it's a banker or any type of lender, that you have a good income, you have a good net worth, I mean, your, your possessions outweigh the, the debts or the money that you owe. And you also have good control of your personal finances, meaning you pay your bills on time, you don't overuse your credit, you don't have too much credit, so you have good control of your, of your finances, your personal finances. So what I'm coming across now, which is much more common than having working with people with credit scores in the 600s or even 700s, I'm coming across the vast majority are in the 400s. Okay, so credit score in the 400s is considered poor. 
Okay, it's considered risky. It's usually the case as I'm helping people develop their plan on how to repair their credit scores and, and repair their finances, it's usually due to overspending. Okay, so it's, it's not usually due to someone not paying their bills or, or paying bills too late. It's usually overspending. So it's overusing credit cards. It's overusing store cards. It's getting caught in that cycle of you have a lot of balances on those cards and you're having trouble making payments. A lot of the time you're only making the minimum amounts, a minimum uh, monthly payment on those balances. And that's really the game that these companies really want to catch you in. Visa, MasterCard, American Express, these different store cards, they want you to run up a high balance on these, these forms of credit and they want you to pay high interest on it for years and years and years. They want to catch you in that cycle where they're just going to slowly bleed you over a long period of time where you're paying tons of interest on things you purchased years before, whether it's clothing or a vacation or repairs for a vehicle, whatever the case may be. So that's the most common situation I'm coming across. So rather than, um, as the chairperson said earlier, rather than me speak for a while and then have some questions at the end, if you have a question as I'm going through these different subjects, just throw up your hand and we can, we can address the questions uh, right on the spot. So when it comes to credit scores, what I'm coming across with the, with the individuals I'm working with is when you have a credit score in the 400s, whether it's around 480, 490, it's usually telling me when I see the person's credit scores, they have a lot of debt, I mean they have a lot of credit cards, like multiple credit cards, multiple stole cards with high balances, and it's also telling me that they're having trouble making payments on those cards. And I have to point out, when I first started this work over a year ago, I just made the assumption, because I've been doing this work for going on 23 years, I made the assumption a lot of people I'd be working with would have maybe lower incomes, right? You know, maybe young, young uh, couples, young individuals just starting in their careers. They don't have that high paying jobs yet. So they have limited income and they're, they're spending, you know, they're raising a family, they have young children. Makes sense, right? That's the assumption I made, but the assumption wasn't correct. What I've come across is that I'm working with people in all different areas of age. I'm working with older people, older people like in their 60s, 50s and 60s. I'm working with young people in their late teens, 20s. I'm working with young people that have very high incomes. I'm working with people that work in uh, mining, that have very, very good incomes. They make a lot of money each year. I'm working with young um, ladies that have good administrative jobs. They work in uh, different community organizations in their community and they have high salaries. So it's not just low income. So what I'm finding is that even though I'm running into couples that have a lot of income, that have a lot of good annual salaries coming in, they're still overspending. And no matter how much money that they're earning, they're still spending more. Okay, so it's, it's not a question of different income levels that I'm running into, it's a question of spending habits. And that's really what it comes down to when you, uh, if you, hopefully all of you, you attend our session at some point. It's only a, a couple of evenings and I, we promise it's not that painful to sit through our presentations. What you're going to see is we're going to have a recurring theme. Okay, the recurring theme to our presentations is getting a handle on your spending habits. Okay, not overspending, not, not spending on money that things that you don't really need. Okay, and you got to keep in mind when you go shopping, whether it's online, a lot of people, they shop online these days, or if you take a trip down south, or even if you go to the local grocery store. When you go shopping, maybe not, maybe not the local grocery store, but when you go shopping down south and you go to a mall or you go to a store, those malls and those stores are carefully designed and carefully set up for you to overspend, okay? They're not set up for you to spend as needed they only spend on certain things. If you go into a grocery store anywhere down south near Montreal, just the way the aisles are set up in a grocery store, there's always things on the end of the aisle that are considered impulse purchase items, whether it's a bag of chips, soda, chocolate bars, candies for your young ones, whatever the case may be, they put it right at the end of an aisle so you can't help but see it as you're turning the corner and going into the next aisle. So what the grocery store companies are trying to do is to get you to overspend, to get you to see that thing as you're turning the corner and pick it up and throw it into your basket. 
Same thing with malls. Okay, the way malls are designed, whether it's in Ottawa or Montreal or Val d'Or or wherever you go shopping, malls are always set up for you to overspend. Okay, just the way the stores are laid out in the mall, when you go into a boutique, whether you're shopping for yourselves or shopping for your little ones or shopping for your family, the way that store is set up, you'll see big signs with this item's on sale, 50% off. You'll notice the next rack over is high expense items that isn't on sale. They want to attract you to a certain area of the store. Look at maybe the things that are on sale, but you, you probably won't buy it or not of great interest, but get you next to the high expense items that are attractive to you and you're, you'll be tempted to pick up and throw into your, you know, your basket or whatever you're, you're shopping around with that day. So again, when it comes down to personal finances, really it comes down to two things. Is one is understanding your spending habits. And once you understand how you spend your money, how you earn your money and how you spend your money, it's getting a good, uh, getting into a good spending, I guess, discipline, a good disciplined spending style. So having control of how you spend your money. Not overspend, living within your means, and being able to keep yourselves in a good financial position. What I see again commonly, again working with individuals from all nine communities, is a lot of people overuse their credit cards. Okay, so everybody, pretty much everybody now in modern times, you need at least one credit card, right? You need a card to book a flight with Air Quebec, you need a card to rent a vehicle, you need a card to uh, book a hotel room. Okay, so everybody needs a credit card. But you don't need five credit cards. Uh, you don't need five credit cards and ten store cards. Okay, so all of those items, if someone look, if you look in your purse right now, if you look in your wallet and you have two or three credit cards and you have four or five store cards, all of that is bringing down your credit score. Okay, even if your balances are zero on those cards. Okay, it's still available credit that you can walk out tomorrow and max them out. Okay, you can go shopping tomorrow and max out all of those cards. So by having all of that credit available to you is a danger uh, to lenders. It's considered as a risky situation for lenders. So someone who may be looking to uh, provide a mortgage for you, a bank manager, if they see you with eight cards or, or ten credit cards, it is problematic for yourself. So again, if we, we touch on a couple of subjects today in the little time that we have, is take a look at your wallets, take a look at your purses. If you have more than one credit card and you have more than one store card, think real hard about do you really need those things. You know, most of the time, I understand how people actually apply for those cards, is you went shopping, you had a bunch of items, you went to the cashier, and the cashier offered, if you apply for a store card today, you'll get 25% off, or you'll get 30% off, whatever it is, which isn't such a bad deal. You, you save some money at that time. But carrying that store card for years and years isn't healthy for you financially. So if you can all could go home later tonight, take a look at your, how many cards you have in your possession, credit cards, store cards. Think about which ones are, are really needed and which are kind of just there for no particular reason. If you can get your balances down to zero, call up the company, cancel the card, chop it up with scissors, it's only going to improve your credit scores and improve your financial standing. Anybody in this room, all you need is one credit card. You don't need any more than that. You don't need multiple credit cards. There's no benefit to it. A lot of people that I work with, helping them repair their finances, what they're doing is they're transferring. They have a high balance on one card, they get a new credit card, and they try to transfer the balance to the new card. Okay, that's, that's only a shell game that's only going to help you for a small amount of time. It's going to catch up with you and it's going to hurt you. So again, just to repeat, the sessions that we go over with, the two evening sessions at each community, we focus really hard on helping someone get a good handle on their personal finances. The goal for us, Lawrence and myself, our, our mandate is to prepare anyone, doesn't have to be young people, but anyone for home ownership, which is, uh, is the biggest financial decision that most people will make in their entire lives. The average cost of building a home in the nine communities is over $300,000, so that's more expensive than just about any vehicle uh, that I can think of. So, and it's usually a long term. If you're getting involved with a mortgage, you're looking at 20 years plus. So it's a long term commitment. 
Any questions before uh, I, I move on to a couple of other areas? No questions? Okay, so just to wrap up this, our, our time here on the agenda, I'd like to talk about home ownership very briefly. Another common question that I get is from, especially from younger people, who, um, you know, social housing is, represents the majority of housing in the nine communities. I believe there's only about 400 or so private homes um, throughout the nine communities. And uh, there's well over 3,000, going on 4,000 homes in total. So private ownership is a, is a tiny portion, roughly about 10%. So a lot of questions I get from individuals is why should I, why should I get my own home? Why should I pay for my own home? If my rent in my community is only, let's say, $600, and if I get my own home and I have a mortgage, I'm going to have to pay, your mortgage may be $1,200 a month, it may be $1,400 a month, depending on how expensive and how big your home is. So a common question is, why should I pay more? You know, it doesn't, so a lot of people on, on the surface, doesn't make a lot of sense. So what I'd like to talk to you a little bit now is the benefits of home ownership. Okay, so a lot of people, what I advise them is when you look at purchasing your own home, look at it as an investment for your family's future. So when you're living in your community in a rental unit, okay, you're, you're probably living in hopefully the units in, in good shape. It's got no significant problems with it. It's a safe environment for you and your family, which is good. But as you pay that rent, but what has to be made clear is that unit is owned by the community, right? It's owned by the band. A lot of people, they've been living in a, a band owned or CMHC unit for many, many years, 20 years in some cases or more. And they sort of get the idea, well, this is my home, okay? It's like, I've been here forever, I've been paying rent, it's my home. But what's important to understand is that it's still, it still belongs to the community. It still belongs to the band. It's not uh, that individual or that family's property. When you have your own home, when you purchase your own family home, you get a mortgage through a bank and you build your own home, that is your property, okay? If that home is well kept, Maybe if you build a home in the year 2018, by the time that mortgage is paid off in 20 or 25 years, your home, if it's well maintained, well kept, it's gonna appreciate in value. It's gonna increase in value. It's actually gonna be worth more if you decided to, let's say, sell it 25 years down the road. Or if you wanted, if you, had a, if you have a family, have young children, you decide to give your home to, your, uh, to your, one of your children. So it saves them that expense of building a home, which may cost $400,000 25 years down the road. So that's the, the most basic way of looking at home ownership. You're actually building up your net worth, you're building up your equity, you're building up what you actually own. Okay, that $300,000 home, you're paying a mortgage on it. Yes, it's more expensive than your, than your rent, but you're actually owning something. It's an actual asset, a possession that you own. The rental unit, that always will belong to the band. Unless the band were to sell it to you. But, which is not the case as far as I know yet. As far as I know, uh, band units aren't being sold to community members as of yet. So that's the first area of private, an advantage of private home ownership. The second area is that when you build your own home, of course you can design it how you want. Okay, so as you can see, uh, most communities are, are basically the same uh, situation. Homes are built, so many units per year, either CMHC or band owned unit, and it's the same model, right? Usually on the same street, the same model of home is built, replicated over and over and over. Sometimes with the exact same siding, exact same colors, exact same windows. Some communities will mix it up a bit, they'll change the color of the sidings a bit, but it's basically the same home, so there's a lot of repetition. Your home doesn't stand out, okay? So when you buy your own home, it's really up to you. You choose what home design you want to build within your, hopefully within your means, you can afford it. You decide on the colors, you decide on the style, you decide on what you want to have for your family. Okay, it's totally under your control. You design exactly how you want to design it and, and it's yours, it belongs to you. You keep that, that home in good condition, you, you maintain it well. You can pass it on to your young ones, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want. Okay, it's like putting money almost into a, a piggy bank, a savings account. It's for future use. 
So really that's the, the main benefits of home ownership, which is slowly, slowly starting to gain uh, traction in the nine communities. Young people especially, I think, are, are finding, uh, are seeing value in owning their own homes. I would say uh, two thirds of the individuals and couples that I work with now are under the age of 30, which is good. And they have a goal. Their goal is home ownership. A lot of them are starting their families. They already have children. Their goal is to have a home that'll increase the enjoyment of their family, increase the living standards of their family. Any questions before we uh, wrap up? I think our, our time is probably running, running down. Hello? Hi. Is it possible for someone to build their home to make an apartment in the basement, like uh, to be a landlord? Like, I know that uh, sometimes one, one person tried to do that here, but like they weren't allowed. How would someone pass that? That's a good question, and it's, uh, it's one that I've come across a few times over the last year. I've had the opportunity out of the nine communities, I've studied uh, four of the housing policies. So each one of the nine communities is unique. They all have individual housing policies. But out of the four housing policies I studied, um, they all had an area for potentially turning either part of the home or uh, um, the basement of a home into rental units. What really, uh, I guess what's important to the bans or, or the housing departments that approve such things is that the home's a safe, unit that it can be done for. For example, I came across one case where um, it was a private homeowner wanted to turn their uh, basement area into a bed and breakfast where they could rent out the units as needed, but there was mold in the basement. So there was an inspection done and their request was declined. Okay, that, that was one example. So again, uh, most policies do allow for that. It's, it's not something that can't be done. But the whole, it has to be case by case, right? The housing uh, area has to be deemed uh, safe. So, you, so you'd ha like, is there something to apply for to be like a registered landlord or like how does that work? Uh, the, the process? Yeah. yeah, if you're a private homeowner, it would just be a matter, I think, of registering with your local housing department that you would have, um, either uh, long-term leasing, if you want to rent like month by month, or uh, nightly, you know, if it's a bed and breakfast type of arrangement. But as long as they're aware, and as long as the housing unit is safe, I've seen it over and over in different housing policies where it's, uh, it's possible. Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody in the room that's uh, making plans for home ownership? Hello. Any time in the near future? I have future? a question here. To your left. All the way. <laughs> I uh, have a bunch of questions, I guess, concerning, we're from what Max do, so a lot of, uh, like I know a car from just from Weeminji to, uh, to our home is 2,500 or 600. How much does that affect, like with the, mor the, the mortgage cover, the transportation, but how much would that cost? Do you know how much that costs? I am working with uh, four uh, couples in your community are planning for home ownership. The main, it is more expensive. Uh, I'll tell you that 100% for sure. The way that it's working now is all the housing supplies have to come by barge. Okay, so the, uh, uh, there, there keeps being uh, the subject of winter road keeps coming up, but it hasn't been finalized yet. I mean, it keeps coming up, but you don't see a real uh, conclusion to it, right? So now it comes by barge. And each uh, load, I mean, with the, the different renovations and different new units that are being built in your community each year, that's how the supplies come up. And um, I know each bar ship is $150,000, so it really would depend on how much of the barge, how much uh, percentage of the barge you would need for your housing materials. And that cost would sort of be tacked on to the cost of construction. For what I understand, just some estimates from your previous housing director, Brian Wynn, who shared a lot of information, it's usually about an extra 10% to build a home in, in your community than, let's say, Chesapeake, a little uh, further south. What about the usage charges? Does that apply to the mortgage, or is that something separate? 
Uh, pardon? The yeah, usage charge, the land, the land charges, the usage charges. Uh, no, the com as far as I know, online communities, the, uh, the the lot preparation, the infrastructure, that's uh, provided by the community. So along with your uh, subsidy, every community has a housing subsidy, which helps uh, lower the cost of, of yourselves building a home. As far to my knowledge, it's all included. The subsidy, is that per community, like their own thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Each, uh, just now that we bring it up, the, the area of subsidy, it's another common question that I get from individuals. So all nine communities uh, are kind of broken down into different regions. There's, I believe, four different subsidy amounts. I don't want to tell you the different amounts for each community because I don't want to upset anyone, but the logic is that Wagmastu being the furthest north and also having uh, logistical uh, transport limitations has the highest subsidy of the nine communities. And then a little bit uh, further down south, uh, Chisesbi, Waminji, and East Main have a, a slightly lower subsidy for building a house and then you get into uh, the more southern inland communities it's a little bit less so the logic is the closer a community is south to a bigger let's call it city whether it's Valdor or Amos or wherever housing supplies could be provided um, they have a little more accessibility and the cost of building a house in theory should be a little more affordable so the subsidies are kind of designed that way okay that's it that, uh, I hope that helps. <laughs> but there is uh, serious issues with uh, what well, must do in terms of home ownership. Another big one is uh, home insurance, which they're working on to uh, have home insurance more affordable because the rates right now are very, very expensive. Yeah. Any other questions? Is somebody on this side? So with that, we, we left our material over here on the left side. We have copies of the two presentations that we, we cover as we visit each of your communities. We have a couple of pamphlets which uh, introduce the, the subject of home ownership and uh, owning your own home, the benefits, and Lawrence is uh, doing his Vanna White impersonation. <laughs> And I also have a stack of my business cards. So please, even if you yourself may not be planning for home ownership at this point in time, if you have a family member, a friend that is uh, looking for some information and wants to ask some questions, uh, I make myself available. I'm, I'm contracted, mandated to the CN, CNG to provide information as needed. Uh, I travel a lot. It's like I'm, I'm here in. Uh, your community this week, next week, Lawrence and I will be in Chesapeake. If I can't take your call or, or answer your email immediately, I respond to emails and, and phone calls very, very quickly. So no question is too short, no question is too long. Like I said, I've, I've dealt with, or I think we're approaching 500 inquiries now over the last year, which is good. That tells me that a lot of your community members are interested in private home ownership, and they're very seriously thinking about it at some point in the future, which is good. Because you don't want to be relying on social housing, okay? Uh, I, in my works, I didn't just work in Ganawage working with housing. Uh, I worked as a consultant for going on six years now. I worked coast to coast. I worked out in BC. I worked in Alberta. I worked in the Maritimes. I worked down south with some of the uh, tribal councils in, in the U.S., United States. And housing, I mean, you're all unique. Every First Nation is different, okay? Ganawage is different from uh, one of the Nine Creek communities for sure. But the housing situations have very similar trends, okay? A lot of communities, they started just like your community has, or your communities have, is they, they overly relied on social housing, which was good. It was good for a point in time. Your communities needed housing. It solved that, that issue, that need. But as your communities grow, as your incomes grow, your young people want maybe different housing that they've seen for years and years and decades, CMHC and ban units, your needs start to change, right? So a lot of First Nations that I've, I've worked with in my travels have made that transition from social housing over to private home ownership, okay? It, it's not going to happen overnight. It takes time. You have to see the benefits of it. You're going to see it in your communities every year. Private homes are being built in your communities. You're going to see it. You're going to hear those families talking about how much they, they love their homes, how proud they are to be homeowners. And it's going to take time, but it's going to grow. 
And I've seen it over and over again. And if anything, I would say to Cree Nation, you're much more advanced in many other areas than some of these communities were when I worked with them. You're much more advanced politically. You're much more advanced with young people uh, furthering their educations. You're much more advanced with young people having opportunities for high paying jobs, okay? You have a lot of advantages out of the First Nations uh, really don't, okay? So, and that's due to your, your hard work and the hard work of your leadership for, for the past uh, 40 plus years. And you guys are, are the future young leadership of, of your nation and your communities too. So that's what we're really, we're working that area of helping, you know, helping our communities. Not everybody's ready for home ownership at this point in time, but those that are starting to plan for it, that's what Lawrence and I are here for, okay, to answer your questions and provide support as you need it. So if there's no other questions, if there's no other questions, that's all we had uh, this afternoon. What is a good um, salary to be, uh, how can I say, yeah, mortgage eligible? There was actually a, so there's no real bad salary, okay, so uh, it's, it's actually maybe a, a little more uh, complicated an answer than uh, what's good and what's bad for salary, but there's been a lot of financial studies within the, uh, the Cree Nation over the last five years or so. And what we uh, came across in the last two years is that um, we tried to gauge the, uh, the cost of living in all nine communities. And some of your, your cost of living, like the money you pay for groceries, food, other day-to-day uh, -day necessities is, a, is definitely higher in the north than it is in the south. So it's not the same across the board. But the, the Cree Nation came with a, a good average, okay? Trying to take into account the uh, challenges that are, are faced up north versus the situations down south. And they sort of fell on the average household income of $55,000, okay? Which would be definitely, if a person's credit score is in good shape and they have good control of their finances, a household income of $55,000 should be plenty to sustain a mortgage. And we're talking a mortgage in an area of somewhere between 1,200 to 1,400 per month. Okay, and that could, that's not have to be one person, that could be two individuals, right? It could be a couple. And again, the situations fluctuate. So a 55,000 income, if you have one child, is a big difference from a 55,000 income if you have three children, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's really case to case, but we have that, um, I guess that, misconception out there is that a homeowner has to have very high income, has to have an income, let's say, of uh, $150,000 per year or more. Uh, that's not the case. Okay, if a person has strong financial planning, you know, in place and they have a good credit score and have good discipline with their spending, you can sustain a mortgage in that area, 55000 for sure. Okay. Hello. How long does it usually take to get started and to like move in to your home ownership? Like the wait time, applying, all that jazz? It's another, that's another good question. Um, I'll give you an average. Okay, some communities have more housing staff, support staff than others. But I say on average, the process is usually between six to nine months. It can be that quickly. But it's a lot of legwork, right? So I'll just run through the process very, very quickly. Um, usually a couple, they'll go to the bank, they'll get their pre-approval, they'll see how much money they can borrow. Okay, so if their credit score is good, the bank will say, all right, you're pre-approved, you can borrow 300,000, let's say. The couple will get that document, they'll go to their housing department at their local council, and they'll apply for private home ownership. So there's multiple steps with that. One, they have to get a land allotment, right, where they're gonna build their home. Two, they gotta apply for the subsidy, the housing subsidy to help with the uh, cost of building the home. And three, they gotta get a loan guarantee, okay? So the bank needs the mortgage fully guaranteed because the home is being built on Cree land. So if a person defaulted on a mortgage, meaning they didn't, weren't able to make payments, the bank can't come in and seize the home 
It's the nation has to seize the home on behalf of the bank, so it's the nation that guarantees the mortgage. So it's three steps, right, with the council. So there's a little bit of back and forth legwork with each. So sometimes um, those approvals can be made outside of council meetings. Sometimes the housing departments can have a special meeting with sort of like a, a subcommittee of council. But I've seen other communities where the applications have to be approved by the, in a full council meeting. And some councils don't meet every month, right? Some meet every six weeks, some meet every two months. So it really, it depends, I guess, uh, on the individual, how um, aggressive the, the individual and couple is, how much they try to push their applications along. But if, if a person has good energy, it can be done relatively quickly. Construction, I mean, most communities have their construction season down to a science, right? They know when they pour their foundations, they know when their construction uh, is done, and they know when the homes are finished. So it can, be, it can be quick. It doesn't have to be more than a year, that's for sure. Excuse me. How, how long does uh, the average home uh, banks give people to pay back their mortgage? Yeah. The, the most common mortgage terms I'm seeing is 25 years. Okay, that, the max that you can get a uh, mortgage is 27, I believe, in some exceptional cases, but I'm seeing a lot of 25s. But if someone has good income, they have the option of uh, paying off sooner. I've seen some people, they, they develop their budgets. You know, I'm starting to work with now, uh, early on this, this year. So they got really, the, the good thing about budgeting, planning for your personal finances, is it becomes uh, almost addictive, but in a good way. It's people really like to see how their money is being handled and how it's used. And they get used to putting money away or saving money. And they'll get used, if they really get into a good groove, they'll start putting more money away. So what I'm seeing a lot is people that are starting to, private homeowners, they have a mortgage. They were trying to get a better handle on their finances, so they have their monthly mortgage of, let's say, $1,200. But instead, they're deciding, no, I'm going to pay $2,000 this month. This month, I did a little overtime. I'm going to pay $3,000 this month. So they're shortening that, that mortgage term. So they have a 25-year mortgage contract, but they'll probably pay off their mortgage in like 15 years, which is good. They pay less interest. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good thing. OK, I think we're just about out of time. So Lawrence and I, I actually have to catch a flight in a, in a little while. But again, you can grab my business cards. But on the way out, if you have a question that you want to ask that's uh, urgent or something you want to answer today, we'll hang around for a few more minutes. So with that, we, we thank you for your time and uh, we appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you.